Um, so my name is Jimmy Bogart. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Jay Bogart. This presentation and uh, just about everything I do is on my GitHub at github.com slash Jay Bogart. And I blog a lot about this topic on my blog at jimmybogart.com. A few things about me. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP. I don't really know why I get the award. Um, I fill out some spreadsheet every year and they keep giving me free stuff and I accept it. So that's good stuff, I guess. I work for a consulting company here in town called Headspring. And uh, a lot of what I'll be talking about are from projects uh, that I worked on at that company. I do a lot of open source stuff as well. Um, you may have heard of some of those projects over there on the right. Um, you may love them, but you probably hate them. One of the two, there doesn't seem to be any middle ground there. Um, so I want to talk about today um, some of the projects that I've worked on and especially some of the ones that I've had a chance to consult on. And uh, my work as a consultant for companies that uh, ask me to come in and look at their code, um, usually people don't come in to uh, ask to look at, their, my, look at their code when their code is good. Uh, usually it's on the, uh, the kind of opposite end of the spectrum there um, where it's something that they don't, <laughs> they're not really proud of. Uh, they, they, they're wondering why they're having a hard time changing it, why they're not meeting their estimates, not meeting their deadlines. And in general, it's, uh, when I find these, these code bases, in general, they're a big ball of mud or a, a chocolate ice cream stack, I guess, something like that. So one in particular kind of highlighted the problem of uh, what this architecture we'll be talking about today intends to solve. And so this architecture, uh, was built around an application that was just a very simple workflow application. And so this is an application meant to approve uh, some, uh, some work items. And then there were two different views of it. There's like a regular user and an admin user. Um, now the original developers um, hadn't built many new systems in their career. They have mainly been maintaining existing systems. So as part of what they were doing for building this application was doing a lot of research about what current best practices were for building systems and architectures. Um, and so in this application, uh, there were exactly four screens for this whole system uh, with a very basic workflow and very simple role-based security. But to get to those four screens, they somehow generated 20,000 lines of code. And in this 20,000 lines of code, they were, had two separate solutions and 12 individual projects to be able to build out uh, these overall four screens. And all of these things they were building from were like, so it's supposed to be a kind of industry standard best practices about how to build enterprise applications. So when I'm presented with new applications, new systems, to try to figure out how the pieces fit together, especially something with you know, multiple solutions, multiple applications, different projects, what I like to do is take a request in the application, that is someone is viewing something on the screen or someone clicks a button. So let's trace that request all the way from the front end to the back end and then back again, and just see what all the things that need to be touched in order to kind of follow the business logic, as well as if I need to make a change to the system, what are all the places I need to touch in order to make that change? So this application uh, starts out with an ASPX page. And by the way, this is like 2015 uh, that this application was created. So that's like red flag number one was, uh, we probably shouldn't be using web forms like ever, ever again. Um, so that kind of set the tone for me about what I was gonna find next. Uh, that of course, AP ASPX has a code behind, um, still no business logic there, uh, but this application uses WCF like you do. So the next thing we talk to, of course, is a service proxy. Now, this is not the service proxy that comes from WCF. This is a custom one just in case they had to have additional kind of business logic to do things. So they're custom service proxy. This finally talks to the actual WCF service proxy, and this is where the first solution ends. Now, I open up the second solution for the, the back end part of the application because we don't want the front end talking directly to a database. We have to go through some kind of layer. So we have to have this, this WCF service layer which you'll to be able to talk to. So of course, the next thing I need to do is look for the WCF service, the thing that actually receives the request from that front end. Now there was no business logic there, so I kept digging. Uh, the next thing I looked for was what the WCF service called into. It called into a separate project, which was the, the BAL. Now usually when I do this talk, I ask the audience like, well, what do you think BAL stands for? because um, I haven't seen this, this acronym in a very long time. Uh, usually it's, uh, it, it, uh, the B is probably business, and then L is probably layer. Uh, the A, I had to dig and search for, but it was the business application layer, uh, not usually the business logic layer. Uh, in any case, there was nothing in there. It was literally just delegating to yet another thing. So I dug the next step down to see what the business application layer talked to. 
and that was the, the data access layer. Uh, the data access layer was a layer on top of the data, but still there was no actual business logic being done. So all these different application layers, all the way from the front end and out to the data access layer, I didn't actually find any business logic, the thing that was actually doing the real work. Now, where was the real work actually being done? Store procedure. So all of this ceremony, all these different layers were just built in order to call a single store procedure that actually had the real business logic, but none of the other pieces was providing any actual value or any additional, um, any additional, uh, really value to the either the, the developer or to the actual business itself. It was just a bunch of additional ceremony. I can point to something like this and say, well, obviously this is a bad idea, especially with an application this small. But what happens if you have an application that isn't just four screens? What happens when we have an application that is many, many screens and we start to need some kind of organization and structure in order to handle the different logic that we're going to run into. So yes, something like this, it doesn't make sense to have any this sort of structure, but what happens when we try to scale any kind of architecture like this up to, uh, up to larger systems and larger applications? Now, my, me and myself, um, I did not go to school for computer science. Uh, I was an engineering degree. Um, and so when I first got out of school and had my first real application to work with, I needed to learn how to build systems and build applications. And so what I was taught and what I found back then was that the way you build applications is with an anterior architecture. Um, although I never really saw, I guess the, the, the last screen showed like what, eight tiers, I guess. Uh, but most of the time you see like a, a three or four tier kind of architecture um, where I have a user interface layer that's supposed to handle the UI logic. And then the business logic layer, which is of course the business logic. Finally, you don't want to talk directly to the database from your business logic layer. So you need to have something in between. And then finally the database itself. Uh, and I built and shipped applications with this exact structure where I had like, you know, three projects and plus the database to be able to handle the, the stuff in my system. And it seemed to work okay, at least for the projects I was working in, which were usually pretty small. Now, as I started to get bigger applications, um, we found that this kind of architecture didn't necessarily scale. So we went to uh, the much improved version of this, which is the domain-driven design style, domain-driven design style uh, into architecture. I have to go back and forth because they look almost exactly <laughs> they look almost exactly the same. I'm like, well, we used to call it business logic, and now it's services, uh, and now we have a domain layer in there as well. And then finally, we don't talk directly to the database; we have to talk through a repository. Uh, but otherwise, the way we structured the code was was very very similar to what we saw before. Maybe a slight wrinkle there in that we had um, we had domain objects that matched the names that our business used. Um, but usually those, those domain objects didn't necessarily have a lot of behavior. We usually found the behavior was in those service objects uh, up above, because it was rare that we could have business logic that could be completely encapsulated inside of our domain model. And so we had the services, where we really found the business logic that had to coordinate activities between different things. So in this uh, improved style, uh, we had uh, some, applic some applications that we built with this with a lot of success. But then we went to an application that was going to be much larger in scope. And larger in scope, I mean like hundreds of screens as opposed to maybe a two or three dozen. And you might say like, well, don't build a system with that many screens. Uh, but this was before any kind of like microservice or anything like that. So uh, in this case, we thought we were doing okay, especially because we saw this kind of structure work, work really well for small systems and applications. We thought, well, it worked well there, then uh, why not? have it in a much larger application. So in this structure, um, we very quickly started to see cracks in the system. Um, in this kind of architecture, we found ourselves organizing all the code by individual layer. And we usually had projects around each of these kinds of structures. So in this case, we had, uh, if I'm just dealing with something with a, with a person, well, there's, a, there's probably a person table in the database as well. We had our person domain model, we had a person controller, we had the person service where all the, all the business logic around dealing with this person model really resided was in that one service. And then finally, of course, we can't talk directly to the database. So we had their person repository dealing with all the data access logic uh, from that. Now with this kind of structure, when I'm organizing code by individual layer, uh, we tend to find that each of these kind of layer objects starts to grow in size. And if our application starts to grow in size, we tend to find these, these kind of layer-based uh, structures really start to get out of hand. Um, so I've actually got a picture of a repository in this sort of structure. This is, this is like actual production code that I wrote. Um, so although the first example I could say, you know, that's that other developer that did the best thing, this is all me. 
Um, Amy knows as well, like, I didn't actually get the, the in, in curly brace. Uh, the in curly brace is probably somewhere near your feet, uh, down the floor somewhere, about all these different uh, methods that I put on top of this repository object. The reason why this thing got so big is because we had started to have more complex data access logic based on the complex requirements we were seeing from the overall user interface. So a simple repository where I just get a single model back, but that's not sufficient. Um, a lot of times we need to get other pieces of information for that individual domain object. And because we're dealing with the relational databases, then I have to do different joins to get different pieces of information. Well, in SQL land, that's a very simple statement. I just select and then do some joins and here we go. Um, but with ORMs, you have to do some more interesting sort of ORM specific logic. We didn't want that ORM specific logic leaking into our service layer. So then we had to have all these very specific methods to get very specific things to ensure that we didn't actually access the ORM directly. Now, there are some ways to mitigate this, but the overall problem we found is that when we build these objects that stretch across many different requests in my system, that each method is only used really by that one request, it starts to become a big tangled mess. The other big issue we found was just trying to make sense of the code itself. So when we wanted to make a change in the system, um, I was a tech lead in this project at the time, and I wanted to give instructions to developers of, okay, when you want to add a new screen or change a field on the screen, here are all the things that you need to change in order to be able to accomplish that. So I actually whiteboarded this. I said, okay, you need to go to do this object to change this thing, this object to change this thing, uh, over here, over here, over here. And what we found was that um, you actually had to jump around a whole lot in the solution to be able to get anything done. Um, typically, I think our touch points at that point were something like 12 different touch points to be able to add a field to the screen scattered across the solution and different projects and things like that. Even looking at the different requests in the system, I would trace through different uh, different individual requests and then see what different objects that different request touched. And what we found is that when I have these layer objects that are uh, more specific to the data as opposed to the behavior and things like having service layers uh, that deal with it, just uh, everything to deal with that, that, uh, that entity or that aggregate, what we found is that although it could be very straightforward for this kind of first layer, but as I start to, to cross the boundaries and cross the lines, we found that one individual method could be used by a lot of different uh, a lot of different code paths. What that meant for us was, if I have to make a change in some location for one specific request, I have to do a lot of legwork to research: Am I going to break anything else in the system? And so, what I'd really like to do in the systems that I'm building is to not have to do a lot of research about what am I going to break because that worries me a lot. I mean, I'm not generally a worrier, but I do I do I do worry about breaking other things in the system. So it would be great if that if I'm adding a new feature or set of functions to an application that I don't have to worry about at all breaking any sort of existing functionality. I can only worry about adding new things to the system and not worry about breaking other things. So um, in my next really big application that I was going to be tackling, uh, I looked at this picture and said, I don't think this is this is an improvement. I'm, I'm not getting complaints from the developers, just a lot of grumbling about missed estimates and things like that. So I took a step back and said, is this actually adding value to our, our developers? Is it actually adding value to um, the organization, to our team? Is this structure actually improving the system or not? And I didn't know or not, so I thought, why don't we just chuck it all out? That is, let's just hard code everything inside of the controller initially, and then wait for like a month with everything in the controller, like, and you're, not, you're not supposed to do that, because, but at, the point, at that point in time, I didn't trust these different uh, ways of organizing things. So, so let's just put everything in the controller and let's take a step back and say, okay, now that we've got something going on in our system, let's see if there's any patterns that emerge from just dumping everything in the controller and see if we can see uh, what patterns we should be actually refactoring towards. Now, most of the systems I deal with are web applications. That is, there's some kind of either you know, web application that's, that's uh, exposing HTML, or these days, a lot of times I'm building APIs. And in these web applications, we generally see requests fall into two different major categories. That is, uh, requests that are going to get information to show on a screen or return back to another service, or a request to change information. And that comes in the form of an HTTP GET and an HTTP POST. Now, about the time that I was going through this transition of like, okay, let's get rid of our, our service classes and repositories and just put it in the controller and then step back and take a look at what we've got here. Around the same time, 
um, a new concept was emerging around these overall concepts of retrieving information and changing information. And if you look at what these are actually doing from a outside of HTTP and from kind of a uh, just overall structural perspective, we can see that a get is really a query from information. I'm asking the system for some information and then I want to do something with it. And the other side, the post is a request to perform some operation. I want to approve this invoice. I want to ship this product. I want to um, just edit some information on the screen. That is a command to the system to say, I want you to perform this operation. And so this led to the CQRS principle. CQRS standing for the Command Query Responsibility Segregation Principle. And the overall idea here is to split those service classes, those layered uh, objects, split those, uh, split those layered objects into two. Because what we find is that for each of those, those layered objects, only one path is ever executed for every single request. So instead of trying to jam everything together in these kind of God objects, split those objects out into basic command and query responsibilities. So CQRS is really just about uh, creating two classes where once there was one, two classes being the class for changing information and retrieving information, separating those out into two. So if I go back and look at this repository that I wrote, so I have no one up to blame but myself, I can look at this and say, well, if I look at the methods on here, uh, they're pretty much split into these two overall basic responsibilities. I have some methods on here that are about queries, so retrieving information, and there are also some methods on here for commands to modify information. And so I started looking at all these different um, layer, uh, these layer types, and found all these layer types that had all these different methods they were, they were still all split up into uh, methods that retrieved information or methods that changed information. And when I looked at my overall application, I found that when I want to make a change to the system, I'm not dealing with the entire layer all at once. Instead, I'm dealing with individual methods all the way down from the UI down to the, to the service layer, to the repository, and even to the database sometimes. So these overall operations I'm trying to perform are not dealing with things across an entire layer. Instead, what they're dealing with is a set of logic across each individual vertical slice. So when we move towards this architecture, I had to come up with the name of it, and the best I can come up with is a vertical slice architecture. Um, a vertical slice architecture is where we model and organize our application architecture around axes of change. That is, I look at what needs to change in a system, and I, and I build these, these primitives around what changes at the same time and build and organize the code around those axes of change. So what do these vertical slices look like? Well, the first thing we want to do is move all the code related to an individual request that could be scattered across all my different layers of my architecture, move those over into one single place. The idea here is that if I need to make a change or add code to a system, I don't have to jump around the, the code to be able to do this. I put all the code that needs to change together Physically, physically together in the same place. And we'll see what that looks like here in a little bit. But you can imagine that um, if I need to make changes to the view, to the, to the HTML, to the business logic, instead of scattering that across my application into different folders, I move all that, that sort of logic into one single place. Now this does require some refactoring in our case because originally these individual boxes were part of larger classes that were designated to these kind of layer types for each individual layer of my system. But we found again that if I look at each one of those layer types that have those public methods to do some work, whether it's change information or read information, each one of those methods is only ever used on one single code path. So what it can do is take those individual methods used on those one single code paths and move each of them into their own individual class or type. And each individual class or type is dealing with that one request set of logic for that one set of work that needs to do is now completely encapsulated inside each of those individual classes. Now, this is actually a very standard refactoring. You can go back to the Fowler book um, written now 20 years ago. And this, this exact arrow is a called out refactoring that you can do. It's extract class from a method. So all I'm doing here is kind of a standard refactoring of taking this one class that's too big and taking each method and extracting it into its own individual class but the last thing I'm doing is taking each one of those classes and placing it together with other related classes that are dealing with that individual request. So this approve invoice, reject invoice, and flag invoice classes are not gonna live in the same folder. 
they're actually going to live in different folders because I want to separate those out based on the overall requests in my system and not the kind of, they're, they're, they're the same kind of thing. I don't put all elephants together. I don't put all drafts together. I look at the overall requests in my system and say, okay, this set of stuff, I'll change this together. So let's put them all in the same folder. Now we started out with this, this kind of approach where we just took the old methods that were in one giant service class and started to put them into individual service classes. What we found is that um, when we were giving this kind of instructions to our developers to say, okay, uh, what we used to do was build a one service class and have methods, just take that old method and put it into a class all by itself. We started to find that these service classes started to really diverge in how they looked and behaved. And so we wanted to put some structure and say, you know, let's get some uniformity around these, these individual service classes so that the developers don't have to think a lot about how to design or name these things. Um, they all just have a uniform design. And really the work inside of that, those, those classes, that's the most important thing in my system. So we started to see that these things uh, were basically a, a single class was the single method that accepted inputs and had some sort of output. So we, we can abstract that into something that handles requests, takes some input and produces some sort of output. And so this was the abstraction that we used on probably a dozen projects where we would create some kind of request handler class that takes some input and produces some outputs. And then all the requests in our system were built around this, uh, this exact primitive. Well, I got tired of copying this code from place to place to place. And so at some points, um, I was goaded into making an open source project to do exactly this kind of abstraction. And so uh, that was what led into the mediator project, by the way. I mean, you can kind of tell like when that project was created because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not creative with names. And so that was about the time that SignalR was like becoming really popular. And so I thought, okay, this is just a, this is really just a implementation of the mediator pattern. So let's call it mediate R. Um, I actually still don't know how to pronounce that. Uh, it's mediate R or mediator. In any case, it's, it's easily Googleable, which is that, that's the most important thing. Um, so I took these primitives and said, okay, uh, let's, let's, Let's break this down into an open source project that defines something that can handle requests. It defines an input and also defines that output. Uh, what I wanted to do was to apply some uniformity to this though. It says you only get one input and you only get one output. Additionally, I wanted to have some coupling between the input and the output. So in this structure, um, the input is an I request of T. So it's a marker interface, but the key thing here is that the request knows about the response. So I know what's gonna come out the other side. We, the other thing we wanna do is not share requests and responses between individual things in my system because that would lead to additional coupling and that could lead to us having problems when we need to change things in the future. We wanna have a very explicit coupling between request and response in my system so that each request has one handler and one response. So if I need to make a change in my system, I have that confidence to know that if I make a change to the handler, to the request or the response, it's only dealing with that one individual code path. Uh, now, because we're, I'm in C-sharp and it's an object-oriented language, um, if I was doing this in a functional language, uh, if there's any F-sharp folks on the call, by the way, they're probably laughing because this is really just a functional style of building applications, but I'm in C-sharp, I'm in OO land, and trying to build a functional style is just ugly as hell, so I'm not gonna try to do that. Um, instead, we have to have this object-oriented style. Um, I'm also going to be using dependency injection for these request handlers to be able to inject dependencies. So whatever you think, whatever that request handler needs to do its work is going to be injected in to its constructor as opposed to passed in through that handle method. Now with uh, ASP.NET Core, this is now super easy to do. You can just say add mediator and give it the uh, give it a type or assembly to scan for handlers, and we'll register all those handlers that it can find in my DI container. But that's not the most important part. Just I need some way to find all the handlers. And so this is a one line way of doing it. So I have a way to define requests, handlers, and responses. So how does this actually track back to the overall application architecture that I'm trying to deal with, which is CQRS application having gets and posts. How do I model this in terms of handlers? Well, if I look at a query, a query is, uh, is eventually going to track to, to some method on a controller likely, and that controller is going to have some logic. What I'm going to do is take that logic and move it into an overall handler to be able to handle that query. So uh, for the query side, we're going to have some sort of query definition 
and that's going to be passed to a query handler. And finally, the response is what's I give back to the end user, uh, either to uh, an API or to render as HTML. And a post is going to be very similar. I'm going to have some definition of the command uh, information that I want to change, and then that's going to be given to a handler. And finally, um, I'm going to have some sort of response. So this comes down to having, um, for each of these handlers, one model in and one model out. So in terms of modeling the request on my system, it starts to become very straightforward. So it's just defining these query objects, defining the response objects, and then my developers are really uh, tasked with uh, coding that code in the handler to be able to, to uh, accept the request and fulfill the response. Now these handlers are intended to have complete encapsulation over the request and the response. So anything that that um, handler needs to do should be inside of that handler and not, uh, and not something that's done before the handler or after the handler. Um, the general idea is that um, from the application perspective, I, get, I receive a request, I hand it off to the mediator to hand off to a handler, and then I receive a response. But inside of that is a complete black box to the application in terms of what the logic is actually being performed inside of there. And we'll see here in a little bit uh, what that entails because that box can get big for the handler. So we're gonna have to deal with that in some form or fashion. So let's look first at how we would model the query side of the equation. Now the query side uh, is dealing with uh, first that request object coming in. So if I looked at an overall controller action before I performed any of the refactoring, I need to look at this controller action and say, well, what, what constitutes the quote request in the system? And for a request, it's a few things. Well, first of all, it's the request parameters to this controller action. That defines the inputs to the overall handler. It's those things I'm passing in through the query string that are going to be passed eventually down to my overall request handler. Now, some queries are simple, as they don't have any parameters passed in through the, uh, through the controller action method. And so those query classes, the, re the request classes, are just going to be empty. Um, but they are going to be scoped. So you can see here that uh, this query class is scoped under an index class. And so I could either do namespaces or classes, however I want to do it. I want to make sure that this query request is logically uh, defined under some kind of structure that, that corresponds to the requests in my system. This is not any generic query used for anybody. This is a query used for an index page on some specific section of the application. Now, some queries are going to have parameters. And so those are going to be the, the action parameters, the query string parameters, um, or if you're using a web, uh, a, a, a desktop application, it's the form information on the screen. Um, all of those different parameters, those direct inputs into the request are going to be properties on my request object. So I just take all those different action parameters and create properties in my query that will eventually be passed down to my, uh, my overall handler. The general idea here is that my handler shouldn't have to reach back out to get input information for its request. It should all be on the request object, so it just takes the request and can just perform what it needs to do based on those direct inputs to, into it. Now, queries can get complicated, right? I can have uh, paging and sorting and filtering. I can have complex search screens with lots of fields on them. And all those fields, all those, uh, all those, all those different uh, form fields are just going to be mapped to properties on this overall request object. So I have the request object defined, but you notice that the, the, the class is defined as a request of some response type. And so I also have to define what that response looks like. Now the response kind of depends on what kind of application I'm building. So I don't build the responses in a vacuum. Those responses are really defined and designed based on how this one request needs to be performed and used by either the subsequent parts of the application or the end user. But I want to make sure that everything the next step needs to do to perform its work is on that response object at the door. It doesn't have to go through additional uh, changes or enrichments. It's everything that's needed to do to now pass it to uh, the user interface or the next system is all on that response. So I went back to my controller action and said, okay, how do we, how can we define the outputs to the next step in the process, whether it's running HTML or turning JSON? So I can look here and say, well, let's just find all the outputs I'm passing back to the end user. 
And this kind of depends what kind of application architecture you're working with. Or if you're working with MVC or Web API or Razor Pages, um, this is the all the stuff that needs to be passed to kind of the representation step of the web pro, uh, web request process to say, I need to take this data and now transform it into HTML, JSON, XML, whatever it might be. So in this case, I look at what are all the things in my controller action that are that are data to be passed to the overall representation rendering step of the process. So I've got view back stuff, but I've also got a, uh, a, a strongly typed view model that I'm also passing as well. So all of those different pieces become properties on my response object. And so all those different pieces, like all the different things I'm showing on the screen are then now pulled up into the response. Now, one key thing here is that these responses need to be very dumb DTOs or data transfer objects. I don't want any kind of like ORM entities, entity framework things where uh, if I go down the wrong property path, now it's making a behind the scenes database call. I want these things to be as dumb as possible and represent only the information I'm going to show on that screen. So some of my systems would just pass through entities all the way down to the view or out to the end user, but uh, that could pass much more information than they actually need. So I want to make sure that the response models, things coming out of the handler, are only the information necessary to be able to pass back to the end user and nothing more. So simple models um, would just be a set of properties, just like a flat set of properties and, and nothing else. Um, and so if I looked at, uh, you know, this is probably dealing with some kind of domain object. A domain object has a lot more stuff going on, but I don't want to give everything back to the end user. I only want to give back the information that's necessary to show on that screen. So I pare down all the properties to be only the things I'm showing on the screen and nothing more. Now, sometimes you can have more complex responses from queries. So in this case, I've got kind of like a, a parent-child relationship with a model. So I've got um, some kind of summary information as well as a, a table of detail information as well. And so the way I model that is with just a single class that has the top level properties and then a list of objects that is the table of properties that are gonna be showing uh, down below on the screen. But what I'm not gonna do here is go back to my old way of pulling back the full domain model for that, uh, that child property. I'm still gonna create a type that is only the information I'm gonna be showing in that piece of uh, code on the screen and nothing more. And then sure, I don't accidentally share that, that, that DTO amongst other parts of my application. I'll actually nest those models to ensure that you don't accidentally pick up the wrong class or the wrong type. Everything's sort of captured and encapsulated in this one single request. Okay, so now that I've got the request object, and I've got the response object, uh, now's the middle part, like the meat of the code, which is going to be that query handler. Now, this at this point, um, we just taken the code that was hard coded in the controller action, and we just stuck it in the handler. We we made we model the request, model the response, and then the last little piece was whatever I needed to do to be able to to take the request and build out the response. So sometimes this is going to be very very simple. Um, we still use Automapper a lot in our projects. So in this case, I'm using Automapper projections, which uh, translates the DTO into a link select statement, which eventually gets translated by the query provider into a select statement that is just the properties they find on the DTO. So in this case, with this Automapper projection, which is that line that says project to, um, I'm projecting an entity to a DTO, and that projection through link results in a SQL statement that is only the set of properties that have selected as part of that DTO nothing else, nothing more. So by going through this kind of projection step, um, it ensures that I don't have to have uh, any kind of like lazy loading or anything like that. Uh, the, the query provider looks at the select projection and then makes the exact SQL statement necessary to be able to put that data into that, uh, into that DTO. Now, sometimes my queries get complicated. Um, so my handler can, if it wants to, then drop down into whatever kind of data access strategy it wants to. So in this case, it's using SQL, just kind of raw SQL to be able to get the information out. This, of course, is a kind of a dumb SQL statement, um, but I have had cases where the SQL gets very complicated and my ORM is no longer sufficient or effective in being able to, to take that SQL and then fill out a DTO. So in some of my projects, uh, we have two different um, libraries we use for write paths and read paths. For write paths, we may use the ORM, and then for read paths, we may use a micro ORM or something like Dapper that is just responsible for taking SQL and produce and then filling that into a DTO. Um, but the key thing here is that that logic, that strategy 
of how to fill the request, how to take the request and fill the response is 100% encapsulated inside of this individual handler. So this handler needs to change. It does go from an entity framework to something else. I can do that in this one spot and not worry about affecting any other handler in my application and system. And that's pretty comforting for me as a developer to say, I know that if I change this spot, I'm not affecting any other request in my system. And if any other request changes in the system, they're not going to affect me. So inside of my handler, I can do whatever I want to be able to fulfill the request. It could be an ORM, it could be one of those micro ORMs. I could call out to an API, to go out to some other web service or something like that to be able to fulfill the response. I can combine these things together however I want to. I can put whatever I want to in this handler to be able to fulfill that request. Um, and that's 100% encapsulated for my system. Uh, from the from the calling logic, I should say. Now, something needs to know how to like fill in the details of the ORM, the HTTP client. So in these systems, you're going to have some setup code, um, but that's really no different than uh, any other kind of application architecture strategy is you will have to configure these different items in some kind of like setup configuration. Um, but that's regardless of the strategy, you'd have to do that anyway. The key thing here is though, is my calling logic doesn't know about that. It just says, here's the request, do whatever you need to do, and then give me the response. Let's go on to the next step. Now, as we build out these overall handlers in my system, we may run into the case where we find some sort of duplication between individual handlers. Now, I will say that this happens much less frequently with queries than with commands. With queries, it's not that common that you have to query common data across a set of requests, but it does pop up from time to time. And so when I see duplicated logic between multiple handlers, what do I do? What I do is, actually it's behind me somewhere, is reach for the, uh, the Fowler uh, refactoring book because duplicate logic amongst multiple classes is again a, a, a well-defined code smell with well-defined refactoring techniques to handle and, and, and gather that common logic together so that those different classes, handlers can be able to uh, do that. Now queries themselves, um, I tend not to, to extract a lot of complex types and classes to be able to encapsulate that common logic. Um, it could be a class, it could be just a, a static helper method, um, a lot of times what I do is just do extension methods uh, on top of whatever data access thing I'm using. So if I need to get like, what is the current logged in user? Or give me the, the roles and, and um, permissions for this user. I just go to an extension method that's encapsulated all that logic for me. And each of those handlers calls into that common logic. Now, something you have to be very, very careful here is um, when I have two handlers now using the same logic, well, that does introduce some coupling. So just like the fellow book recommends, um, just because I copy the code once doesn't mean that I do uh, extract that into some common code. But if I copy it twice, that could be a, 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 a indication to me that I need to extract that logic into some kind of common location. It's not required, but it is a indication that I need to do so. Okay, so that's queries. Let's now look at commands. Now commands, uh, even though the, the overall structure looks similar, I have a request handle response, the commands are gonna look much different than the queries in terms of the requests and responses. The commands are gonna have a lot more going on in the request types because the commands are gonna to have to have all the information the user system has entered in order to perform and fulfill that request. So in uh, this request uh, where I'm needed to edit this information, I need to de decide what are the different properties that are going to be on the request. But what I'll do is just look at the form on the page and say, well, well, I've got these inputs on the screen. Those just need to be mapped to the request object to be uh, delegated to the handler. And if I'm building task-based user interfaces, that is user interfaces that have uh, user, uh, user experiences that tie back to a specific task the user is trying to perform and not a generic task like create thing, edit thing, but instead very specific to what that user is trying to do, then each of these, these buttons, each of the forms on the screen are gonna be defined around each of these requests, handler, and responses. So each of these kinds of tasks or actions that user wants to perform are going to be separate request handlers, uh, types, and responses. So every single button on the screen becomes its own individual request, handler, and response. 
So if you're building uh, task-based user interfaces, and I find that this kind of approach actually fits very well with that kind of user experience uh, strategy. Now, what about the response? We saw it with queries, and that queries usually had a very small request object, very large response object. What we find with commands is that those have been flip-flopped. In commands, the request object is much larger, and the response object is much smaller. We could have some requests that have no response. That is, I ask the system to perform the thing, but I'll, the only thing I need in confirmation is that it didn't throw an exception. So I pass it to the handler, it does its work. As long as it didn't throw an exception, then we can uh, safely understand that it was successful. A lot of times, though, I'll have some kind of response as part of that. Where I have a request, I need to have some kind of feedback from the handler to know not just was, uh, you know, did it not throw an exception, but some additional feedback. Um, it could just be as simple as success fail, like true or false, that the thing was successful or not. That I don't want to have exceptions be the thing that tells me it was successful or not. I want an actual like Boolean value that I can check in the calling logic to be able to perform some alternate path based on failures. It could be for some requests that um, I'm not just returning true or false, but I'm re also returning the identifier of the thing that you modified or created. So in the case of the creation path, where I say, okay, I want you to create this new thing, um, the handler is going to return back the ID of the thing you created so that the calling logic, whether it's an API or um, controller, can then uh, issue that redirect to say, I, I, you created the thing and now I'll redirect you to the URL of the new thing that you just created. But this can get complex. Um, we've had some cases where it's not sufficient just to say, you know, true, false, success. But if something failed, I need to have a reason why it failed. So kind of a kind of a domain validation sort of response. And so for those, I might have, you know, the actual payload of the response as part of just one property in that command result, but also have the reason why it failed. And then a just simple boolean to say, was this successful or not? So uh, I can check in the calling code to say, was this successful? And then do some other logic. And if it's not successful, then I will show and return the failure reason back to the end user about, you can't approve this invoice because it's already been canceled, whatever that logic might be. Uh, oh, I don't care about that. Um, and so when I'm building out these applications in my system, we start to notice uh, kind of a natural coupling between some requests and some response. So in a web application, when I first want to show a form on the screen, I often need to make a request to the system to say, um, give me the information for this form I'm going to show on the screen. So in a server-side rendered application, you'd have an initial get, that is, to show the form. And then you click the button, and that's the post to perform the response. And so I can, I can model that explicitly to say, the query is a request that returns the command, which is just the pre-filled information. And then finally, the, the command has then the user modified information that they can then post back up to perform that action. Now finally, let's look at the command handlers themselves. Now, the way um, I, I kind of teach my teams to go through this, this CQRS journey, is don't try to perform any sort of premature or upfront optimization or design of these overall handlers. Um, if we can uh, build up our refactoring techniques and, and uh, chops, then we should be able to take those handlers and refactor them to what we want them to be uh, based on the actual logic we see in them. So the first thing we want to do is just make it as dumb as possible. So just make it the dumbest, most procedural code, just hard code everything, um, just you know, procedural as much as possible. Um, in the Fowler Enterprise Application Architecture book, this, uh, this kind of code is known as a transaction script. We have a transaction that's just procedural code to just perform all the steps in the, in the action and be done with it. So I, I tell my team, just start with that. Start with the, the, most, the dumbest code that could possibly work. And then we can take a step back and say, what does it actually do? One thing that is different with our systems, probably with a lot of other folks, um, is we, we tend not to have any abstractions around any of the dependencies we use. Um, this, is, this all basically came out of uh, when I first de factored the application into everything in the control or hard coded, uh, we decided that we'd only introduce any kind of encapsulations or abstractions on top of our dependencies when we felt pain. So that's the same thing I tell my teams is um, only, introduce any of the, only introduce any kind of pattern or uh, abstraction or encapsulation when the code itself or the test themselves uh, demonstrate the need through some kind of pain point. 
So code smells, pain points, those are the things that drive us towards any kind of patterns we want to use in our system. Now, command handlers, unlike query handlers, can get very complicated. So we need to, we need to make sure we don't panic. Um, this is natural in our systems and applications. What we need to do is rely on our old friend, red green refactor from our TDD stuff. I don't, I admit, I don't do a lot of TDD these, these days. I do a whole lot of automated testing, but in terms of like what happens when, um, it kind of depends on what I'm doing at the time. But the overall steps are, are, the, are the same in that I want to make sure that I start with a failing test, uh, I make it pass, and then I take that step back, the step that most people skip, and look at refactoring the actual business logic behind the scenes. So I, this is the same thing I guide my teams through. Is, um, as you're building the application, make sure you're taking a step back as you build each set of things in the system, step back and look at the code itself, see if it's exhibiting any code smells, and then refactor as necessary. So um, what kinds of things might we find in these handlers? Well, the two big kind of refactoring things, uh, the, the refactoring book things we find um, are large class and long method. It's basically go together because we have a single handler class or single, yeah, single request handler class with one method. So if the class is large, it's because the single method is very large. And so the way we can address those code smells is very well documented in the refactoring literature. There's a set of refactorings we can apply to this code to get it cleaner and include things like extracting a class, extracting a subclass. Uh, I don't do that one very much. Usually it's extracting a class, extract interface, or replace method with method object. Uh, compose method is the one that I use a whole lot. Compose method is taking a long or large complex method and breaking the complexity down into a similar level of encapsulation or abstraction so that when you read the method it becomes much shorter and each statement is, is another method that's being called that does one overall step in the process. So that one I use a whole lot, which is basically just a long method. I extract methods for all the different steps. Um, usually my developers have added code comments and what I do is just replace those code comments with a, a method that actually does the work. Um, oftentimes I will extract methods out and I find that that method is really dealing with logic of some other object. And so after I've extracted that method, I look at the method and say, is this method really dealing with a lot, with a lot of stuff in someone else, some other object? And so the refactoring there is then to move that method over to that other object to have that logic uh, where, it, where it's dealing with the rest of the information in that system. And of course, extract method is just another kind of thing I do with uh, compose method as well. Now this deals with logic on uh, one individual handler, but sometimes the, the logic of my handler becomes a bit more complicated that just simply extracting and moving methods isn't going to uh, deal with the complexity I see in that handler. And so my second favorite refactoring book can help deal with those code smells. And this is actually my favorite patterns book. I know people don't tend to like design patterns these days, but we use them all the time. Maybe we just don't call them by their name anymore. And so this, this patterns book and the reason why I love it so much, because instead of being just like a catalog of like, here are the 12 uh, patterns that we've identified, and it's up to you to figure out when you should use them. Instead, this book talks about code smells and using code smells as the way to drive into uh, refactoring patterns and driving to uh, design patterns, that is. And so some of the patterns that I tend to see, uh, <clears throat> the code smells I tend to see, things like combinatorial explosion. I have a bunch of ifs or switch statements. Um, I have feature envy, like I have one object using stuff from another object, uh, or duplicated code between my overall, um, my overall handlers. So let's look at an example of this. Um, so I've got uh, an example here um, where I've got a, a handler that's got way too much going on. Um, in fact, you can see again, I don't have the closing brace because the closing brace is like down here somewhere on the floor, I guess. Uh, and it's just doing too much logic. Um, and so I can look at this and say, well, what is the work being done here? And most of my, most of my request handlers have like, I need to get the thing out of the database, then I perform the business logic, and then I save the thing. And the get the thing and the save the thing, those are the uninteresting parts. The interesting part is all the stuff in the middle. So it's usually that middle part of the handler that that's the stuff I really want to, um, I want to, I want to refactor and, and be able to encapsulate somewhere else. So if I look at all this code, it stretches down here somewhere, um, that's the stuff I want to, I want to first, I uh, typically first extract a method out, and that tells me like what information it's using to perform its work. And then I will push that behavior somewhere else 
so that, 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 that logic and behavior can be tested independently of this overall set of business logic. And if I'm doing behavioral models and domain-driven design, the place I typically push that behavior down into is into my domain. So now I have the data access code is in my request handler, but the business logic handling has been delegated down into my overall domain. So now all that logic that was extracted out into method, I now move that method over to the domain object. Now the domain object has uh, the, the data coming in, performing the business logic to do its updates. And then when that's done, I can now uh, save the changes uh, for, that, uh, for that object, whatever I did to it. Now that's, uh, that handle method um, has all the information it's ne it needs to be able to perform its work. So it may include the request object, but it may include additional information to perform its work. But uh, it is still encapsulated from other kind of handle methods inside that domain object um, where I am still dealing with that one individual request and not other things uh, going on. You have all the logic being pushed down into there. Uh, now, there are some times where it's not feasible to push it down to the domain object. So in that case, uh, we often do have a kind of uh, a domain layer that includes all of our domain objects and domain services to be able to coordinate requests between, uh, coordinate activities between different models. So in those domain services, I could have, uh, I mean, like a more, a more complex invoice approval uh, set of logic. So I might have an invoice approver service that handles the meat of the business logic. But the general idea is I just use uh, kind of standard refactoring techniques to take the, the, the large set of logic inside my handler and move that over to other objects to be able to encapsulate and test independently. Now, some other things I have to worry about, uh, uh, kind of cross-cutting concerns, um, include something like validation. Um, now, validation is something I have to still deal with on every single request. So how do I deal with validation in this kind of application architecture? Well, I did have to take a step back and say, there's not just kind of a, a, a single kind of validation I have to deal with in my system. Um, there's actually kind of multiple levels or layers of, of validation that I have to perform. So that deals with different validation scopes. Um, I have the, the initial validation uh, of the request validation that can just look at the request itself and nothing else um, to be able to say, is this request valid to be submitted? And you can kind of think of this as, uh, if you figure out a paper form, that what are all the things you have to fill in to just submit the form in the first place? So what are all the required fields and kind of just standalone data validation that just ensures that, you know, like a cat didn't sit on your keyboard, that you've actually fit, uh, you, you filled out all the, the data appropriately on that form just by itself. Now, once I've performed that request level validation, then I typically have some requests that have to look at, at other things to be able to validate that request. And so for that uh, validation, it's more command level validation. So you can imagine like if I have a page that has to approve an invoice and we have a, a business rule that says you can't approve canceled invoices. Well, in the request validation, I don't have that original status on that request. That status is further down in my domain. So I have to go into my domain model or to the database to say, well, what is the current status? Well, the status is canceled, then I need to uh, invalidate that request and say, you can't do this. The request validation can be very simple. Um, I typically center request validation on those requests themselves and pick some kind of framework to be able to, to, uh, to, be able to do that kind of validation. Um, so in this case, I'm using Fluent Validation because Fluent Validation uh, has this generic argument that fits very well into my request models. But uh, a lot of times I just stick with data annotations validation. I just decorate my request object with data annotation saying this is required, this should be a date in the future, this should be great in that field. Um, as long as it can fit into data annotations, um, then I know it's, it's good for request validation. But as soon as I have to step outside of that request, that's kind of when you notice data annotations validation falls down or any kind of like attribute-based validation. So in that case, I start to look at domain validation. So here's an example one. This is a method on my domain model. My domain model is not just performing the business logic, but it's also doing the domain validation or the command validation of that request. So in this case, the approve method isn't just performing the work of approving the invoice. Instead, it's also looking at the, the status of that invoice to say whether or not you can do this thing or not. And now the result it's returning is not just true or false or, or, or void. Um, it's actually returning a command result object that says, was this successful? Or I want to fail this, this command, and here's the reason why like, I cannot approve a rejected order. 
Now this is definitely more complicated than just like request validation with just putting attributes on my request. So I only do this kind of structure, this kind of validation, when it makes sense in projects. Um, I basically wait until the validation becomes too complicated or becomes too much for the request handler to do and then start to move towards this kind of pattern. Now, the last thing we wanna look at is how do we build out uh, those responses? Uh, what do those things need to look like? And if I'm looking at uh, these, these responses, these, these really represent the representation I'm going to be showing to the end user. So those responses need to be built based on the representation I'm going to be showing to the screen. Now my controllers, um, if I'm going a, a kind of a API based sort of approach, uh, my controllers start to become very, very small. And my controllers are really just there to perform routing and nothing else. Um, if you're using ASP.NET Core, you can use Razor pages, which actually fit very well into this kind of structure. And what all of the different pieces need to, need to perform that operation can be encapsulated inside that Razor page or right alongside it. So when I go to the code of my application, I can find the Razor page as well as everything needed to fulfill that request directly alongside it, uh, broken out into individual classes for those individual responsibilities. The data that I then show on the screen becomes that model then I return back to the UI. Now, web APIs are going to be a little bit different because oftentimes web APIs show uh, they have different requests that come into different handlers, but oftentimes I'm dealing with some kind of single page application or just like a React UI and that I perform a request, but it doesn't go to a different screen. It actually just stays on that one screen and I just really want a, a, an update of that information I show on that screen. So this is one of the cases where I actually do share a response model because those response models are really there to drive the, uh, the end user experience. And so if that end user experience is shared, therefore the response needs to share as well. Now there are gonna be some other cases in which I have cross-cutting concerns across kind of every single request in my system. And if I have uh, duplication that's not specific to one individual request, but really to all overall requests, then there are other uh, patterns to be able to, to wrap my overall handler with additional behavior for, to have uh, that duplication removed from all of my requests. And so this is really just a decorator. I can now direct, decorate all of my handlers with some kind of behavior. In this case, I call them pipeline behaviors because I stole the name from someone else, but these are just decorators. And these decorators can stack so that I have, um, similar to like action filters, I have, a, a, a behavior around all of the requests and responses in my system that it can perform some action outside of all of my requests going on. So transactions are a good example of this. What if I want every single request in my system to have a transaction around it? Or I want every single command in my system to have a uh, transaction around it? Well, this is really easy to do with a, with a decorator in the form of a pipeline behavior. So in this decorator, um, I perform the transaction uh, I begin the transaction. Um, I await the next step in the process, which could be a handler or could be another, uh, could be another uh, decorator behavior. And then I commit the transaction and return the response. Something goes wrong, then I roll back the transaction. Some cases I uh, may have to implement a unit of work. And so it's a similar kind of process where I await the next thing and then I complete the unit of work after that next thing has completed and then return back the response. So I've had to do this in cases where the ORM I'm using doesn't implement the unit of work pattern, then I can do this to make sure that all of my handlers don't have to do this unit of work handling itself. It's just for them already in this decorator. I can do things like, uh, I can handle things like concurrency and retries. So um, in this case, I'm dealing with Cosmos DB, uh, which can return, uh, have a concurrency exception. So if I re receive a response back that says there's some kind of concurrency problem, then I can just transparently retry that operation, perform the operation again, and then try to uh, some n number of times before I go ahead and fail. Things like logging too, all those sort of kind of common cross-cutting concerns um, are things that you have to worry about uh, when I have multiple requests and multiple handlers in my system. Uh, registering these I have to do explicitly because I wanna have a specific order uh, with this. So I wanna make sure that I, you know, I, I register in the order that I want them to actually execute. Now, the last thing I'll touch on uh, quickly is testing these systems. Um, if I look at testing um, in this overall kind of flow, 
Um, it actually maps very well to the different parts of tests, which are arrange, act, and then assert. The arrange is really setting up the request and data needed for the handler. Act is calling into the handler, and then assert is then asserting on that response. With this kind of approach, though, I do make sure that I, re I reproduce reality as much as possible. So I will kind of I will execute the same startup stuff that my application does to ensure that when I call to the handler, it matches as much as possible as what production does. Individual requests will also map exactly to how the overall application actually performs requests. So I look at the code that that's doing and say, let's go ahead and perform this application logic as well. And when I need to set up data, setting up data in a real system is performed in transactions. So I also make sure when I set up data in my tests, it's done as part of a transaction as well. When I send requests down to my mediator, that's also done as part of a overall scope request and transaction. So I make sure my test, when I want to execute a handler, it's actually performing an overall scope transaction. Then in my tests themselves, it starts to look very much like kind of an acceptance uh, test where I'm sending requests down, I'm testing things based on the result coming back out. So I send a query down and start the results. Uh, I do make sure I try to test through the front door. That is, I will send the same request down to set up data as the user interface would use. So the same, same requests um, calling the same handlers that the UI does to ensure that the test setup, looks, uh, the, the data setup is very similar to my application. Sometimes that doesn't work, so I'll set up data directly when necessary. But in my, my tests themselves, it's complete round trips throughout every single step in the process to match as much as possible how production actually works. But instead of going through like HTTP or Selenium or something like that, instead it's working one level down through my request and handlers. So what does it look like in terms of kind of the test pyramid? We wind up having our integration tests dealing with the overall handler and behavior pipeline, but then unit tests are gonna be testing directly that rich domain model that I've been refactoring towards as I build out each of these individual handlers. I don't unit test handlers, I unit test the naturally isolated domain model. So the key takeaways here, uh, vertical slices in this approach make it very easy to add, change, and delete code. Uh, we wanna make sure we don't skip that refactor step. We never should be skipping it, but especially as with this approach, because things just go in the handler first, we wanna make sure that we take that step back, look at the code smells, and perform that refactoring. If we're doing domain-driven design, those refactoring is gonna be with a specific direction in mind, which is to push the behavior down into your domain. And then finally, we wanna make sure that um, we're integration testing handlers, but we unit test domain. So that was vertical slice architecture. S say yes to celery and say no to these stinky uh, layered architectures. Um, this uh, is on my GitHub at github.com slash presentations. Uh, there's a bit lead to an actual code example. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much and hope you'll have a great rest of the conference. For me, it's time for... I don't think